Welcome back to the last of the official sessions of PETA. Of course, the course will continue for the next uh, one and a half days. But this might conclude the main part of it. Enjoy. Yeah. Um, okay, so I will uh, start by to know what happens <laughs> after the last lecture, possibly. I don't know. Uh, I start by giving you two exercises. Of this unstable kind of, we ask this unstable construction that results we had. So we we last uh, put ourselves in an abstract setup, uh, the Cartesian closed with that kind of image category of the group project, and out of the group project we constructed sort of projective spaces and finite spaces so that P infinity is, is a classifying space, a kind of compatibility argument. And well, okay, so uh, first <laughs> Well, I guess this I guess this general proof, which works in all kinds of settings. But we also checked our intuition in the topological setting with this homotopy, right? This is homotopy, which was there in the corner of the board, if you remember. And one exercise is to show that uh, other homotopy spaces, if you, if you are confident to do that, or in spaces, meaning topological spaces, right? Um, the infinite Persimanian Spaces and the So and this is used the uh, argument by homotopy. In this, maybe, maybe you know, uh, you got schemes that have a functor, it is, sends a ring to the rank, well, okay, in schemes, the any papers manion sends a ring to the sort of encryption, maybe, right, there's modules or something. To maps more elegantly, but you can say uh, this goes to rank K and plus K matrices with entries in R. Maybe you know some fancy and white strip film, but that's that's the one. And take we can do that. Modulo Yaris group, yes. Modulo Ah right, uh, okay actually no I didn't yes. Modulo equivalence, that's true. Well the equivalence is uh, multiplied by GLMK, right? Not by G uh, GLMK K times GLM N minus K times M N uh, minus k uh, Right, okay, so uh, maybe, the triangular matrix. Yeah, you're uh, okay, so maybe what I want to give us a hint is not actually that then. Uh, I rather want to talk about the frame bundle on top of this manifold. 
of this scheme, possibly. It's called an FR replicator, then, which is on top of it. So these are actually bases now for dividing off the decisions. And so this can be covered. Now, such a matrix with entries in R, and uh, columns and K rows. Uh, has, has full rank, has rank K. If I find a K cross K submatrix by choosing some columns which has determinant non zero, right? And so that's, if, if I choose some fixed columns for that, that's a subscheme, an affine subscheme. It gives me an affine covering. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, a matrix has rank k if I, have, if I can choose some of these columns and, and find out that the corresponding k cross k matrix is um, invertible. And for every choice of k columns, I get an affine scheme covering this. And this then I can take the intersections. This gives me a diagram which glues together this, this space here. And now, Matrix A, send it to A together with another K cross K matrix, which is zero. <coughs> so in every step, I, I add another K cross K block here. If I take this huge co limit, I, I get infinity frames. So I get more and more opportunities where to find my K, my virtual K cross K sub matrix, as I previously said. <coughs> And that's a bit like what we did for projective spaces in this other proof. We added a zero at the end, right? With this embedding. And then we had a, had a homotopy, really written down by hand, which, uh, which on the one hand had this, on one end had this embedding here, and the other end had, <coughs> had the embedding, which made this zero and this here constant, the k plus k unit. So, maybe do the logical setting if you want. But what do you write down will make sense out of that. Then you can see in the end that there was no point to go into the quality. Yeah, if you do that, I mean, this is a constant map because here's a, a one particular matrix, just one point in the space of matrices. And so then you can repeat the same argument that the co limit here always gets the constant maps. So this here will be equivalent to a point, contractible. Yeah, so So if I divide out the appropriate uh, action, I get to be GL, GLK. <coughs> then I get BGLK. That's the line of argument. And Let's see whether you understand the kind of freezing around it, but I mean this part, just showing that this space is contractible, that should be doable with the kind of homotopy argument that you saw in the projective space case. And the rest is check whether I understood the arguments of the lecture. If not, then it's what we talk about it again. So here's a second. Exercise. We've seen, uh, you know, that as one slash GM and schemes, P1 
one, right? So that also the affine line of the double point is pure. So that is the proportion of, of two affine lines. Identify every every pair of points except for the zeros. I guess everybody sees this as an example of a non-separated scheme. This in particular shows that uh, being separated is not an A1 topically variant property. Mm -hmm. This one is separable. Mm -hmm. Sort of further show, but take that. So, so this is doable simply by by this abstract setup and then the real properties that we, that we use to define categories involved. So I, I tell you now that there is a model structure or like a, a notion of cofibration on, on on this. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it goes too long. To exercises. Okay. Anyway, there's more reasonable things that we can pay for. There. I delete this if you don't object. Okay, so the last thing we did was uh, oh, the P infinity is BG, where this was sort of find as contractible G space and G, which is not a very satisfying definition maybe. I don't know. I like it. Okay. <laughs> I mean the role that this should play is as the base of the universal G bundle. Well there's there's a notion of G principle bundle, yeah that's that's a fiber bundle such that for every point here, or well, it's what we call this one P here, it's, you know, Q. It's, it's a copy of the same fiber, and here we want a principal bundle to be a G. That's what you should think. And uh, yeah, it should be locally trivial. So locally of the form uh, some open here across the G. So such uh, G principal bundles. Have, have the following property, they all come from a universal bundle. So there's a, there's a bundle with not the space for EG, BG, and every such bundle comes as a pullback from that one by a unique method up to home to it. That's a, a tech topology. This would be B cross BG. I, mean, I don't know if it's more familiar to you for vector bundles, maybe there you have uh, the Grassmannian. The Grassmannian is a space of sub vector subspaces of some bigger space, and then you have the logical bundle, which over each point puts that vector space, and any vector bundle comes by pullback from that. Mm -hmm. The same happens here for, for these EGs, BGs. And the way to construct this, this universal bundle is to take a contractible space, just for example the one-point space, uh, with a G action, so in the one-point space we have a clear G action, it does nothing, it can, can only do one thing, and then take the homotopy quotient. The homotopy quotient, that was one example that I had in some earlier lecture, it's, it's an evolved notion, you have to do some simplicity resolution, what you have to do is take care that G acts freely on your space. 
You place your given space, this is the point, by an equivalent space on which g acts freely. So, and then take the actual quotient. That's how you take note of the quotient. So you would need something 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 new. So we puff up this point to, to the space so that G has enough room to act freely, and then take the quote. And this will be the total space of this universal bundle. And the quotient is that B G. So this would be this, and this would be defined as B G minus G. So why, why uh, I don't want to go very much into it, but why, why would you think that this may be a universal bundle? If I manage to do such a thing? Well, I mean, for most principal G bundles, every fiber is G. We have a G action on this whole thing upstairs, yeah, just fiber-wise. We can multiply with the elements of G from the left, let's say. And if we take the quotient by this by this action, then we get exactly B, because above, above B, there sits a copy of G, and I, if I push it by the multiplication action, then it's gone, precisely gone. Yeah? Now, given any bundle, how do I get such a map here? Okay, so this, this thing upstairs here is a G space, G X on this. And this is the terminal G space. Now I'm again talking up to home to the theory, right? So this is the this is also G space, it's the terminal G space, so there's a unique map here. And I can of course pass to the quotient as what I defined as being B G. And since uh, this map uh, goes to somewhere where, where the g-action became trivial, it has to factorize with this because this is also the quotient. This is mean on g. And that is, well, gives us a map here. Now we can take the pullback of that. It's called a p, temporarily. And we probably have a map here. Now if you manage to check that this is also g-equivariant, then it must already be in isomorphism because fiber wise it's an isomorphism. Because, yeah, maps between G torsos and it's an isomorphism. It's an upshot. Uh, and a bit of more, a bit more information than just saying point one here G. <laughs> that's, that's what the meaning of the PG is. It's the base of the universal G bundle. And in, in and to write geometry, of course. <coughs> we took GM here as our G. So, BGM classifies uh, line bundles. So, maps from next to so BGM, you uh, know maybe from topology, right? That's, that's what I said before. X from X to C to infinity are the same as complex line bundles. So this year class has line bundles and actually, so now I'm, I'm talking about home to the classes of maps. It's taking a phi zero from mapping space. That's exactly the isomorphism class of line bundles. So this is it's a nice little stability in the home to the category. It's not obvious at all. I, I was quick about it, but I mean, it's, this is actually, I would say, pretty much a complete proof. But it involves maybe yeah, the, the stuff that I said about line bundles and uh, yeah, sure. I mean the so if I compute this mapping space from from X to, to this BG, I have to replace BG vibrantly. Do you know about model categories? So what does it mean? It, I have to replace it by a good object in, my, in the sense of my beginning of the last lecture, meaning this would be a uh, A1 invariant, which this is fine, and as a risk chief, which it's not, because it's, it only gives you the, low, the, the trivial line bundles. But now I want to the risk chief fight, I get locally trivial line bundles, and then, so we need to compute this mapping space, I have to replace it first, and then there'll be here the object 
that to X assigns all nine bundles. That's uh, and now this now to be as max to P infinity, which is a nice geometric division of power. Stable constructions and results. The next thing in our hexagon would be a bit pointed ones, but okay. The point setting we now have a smash prologue because that's not so much to say. I have a few complications there, but not so exciting. Let's go stable. Um, okay, so what we do then is our category C, in which our G lives, and now we have also this P infinity. Remember that I that I said okay, P infinity uh, is now a group object, we can group object. Hmm. In this slide, we, we see again well, it's it's about tensoring of nine bundles. And then hmm. again, must correspond to some multiplication, and let's call it mu. Take the uh, category of topological space, yes. GS1. Mm -hmm. What is P infinity? It's uh, CP infinity. Because then, I mean, S1 is, uh, I see the C star, that's, that's, uh, that, that's what acts on the complex line bundles, and then CP infinity classifies complex line bundles. Mm -hmm. And probably it would also have taken in the logical setting uh, g equals plus minus one. That's s zero, and that's sort of what acts on real line bundles, and that would also be a thing. I didn't actually ever study it. It would have been to to invert s zero. <laughs> Okay, so now we want to stabilize meshing with S1 and with G. And that we said is the same as uh, stabilizing smashing with P1. Actually, there's a little exercise. I mean, I gave you a proof of the utility setting why P1 is S1 smash GM, why this is therefore the same as staring the both, both spheres. Check it again for this abstract setting. Uh -huh. Because P1 was now defined as a quotient by something, and you have to go through an intermediate step to see it again. It's <laughs> not quite the same as the that I gave before. Mm -hmm. Uh, aha, and I have to go to the point of it again. Right? It's a constant source of confusion to forget this. Now here I have like the infinity P1 as many. Mm -hmm. Let's call this one here I don't know, C spectra. And now we're here and we have made this endofunctor of smashing with P1 invertible. What can we do with that? So I want to do the following. I want to construct something like the K-theory spectrum. A spectrum that represents algebraic K-theory in the utility case and topological K-theory in the topological case. We'll have an avatar in this, this high level of generality which specializes to, to those other two. But only using a theorem. So, what is game theory? Maybe I should ask you before I explain. <laughs> Who knows what topological game theory is? 
Ah, das ist Manning, okay. Kennst du das Vorlein? Ich denke, das ist gut. Über das Space, or a Scheme. Ähm, wow, ein Effekt Scheme, dann. Otherwise, I write too much. You send it to the category of vector bundles on X and isomorphisms between those. So it's a group void, just to take just the isomorphisms. Mm -hmm. And it's a monoidal category with direct sum. And you take the nerve of this. Something that I discussed uh, with the subgroup of the exercise class, so I'm not sure who knows the nerve of a category. Talk to others who anyway knew it, so let me check. Who knows the nerve of a category? Okay. The nerve construction is something I put in here now. <laughs> nerve, it's a functor from categories to simplicity sets, and does, as we see, as spaces. And without realizing it, you have applied this functor many, many, many times in your life, namely each time when you've drawn a diagram of a category. Stay tuned. <laughs> and I'm trying to understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Given a category C, I produce a simple set as follows. I say, um, well, I have to say what the levels are. So the nerve of C in level zero has to be a set, right? Then I have to give a set in level one, and then level two, and so on, all the levels upstairs. And to give face maps and degeneracy maps, so I get such a visual diagram. So in level zero, I give the objects of the category. Here I take the morphisms of the category. That would be the same as functors, so hom and cat, on the arrow to see. Here I take hom and cat of two consecutive arrows to see. And so on. I could just make longer and longer strings and then I have to say what are the maps downstairs. Well, here I have source and target of this arrow that gives me an object. Yeah, so, so, so a functor from here to C is just a choice of an arrow in C. And that's also no target. A functor from here to C is just a choice of two consecutive arrows in C. And I have three possibilities what to do with them. I can uh, pick the first, pick the second, or compose them. And so on, as I go higher, I can, have, I can take the first or the last, or compose something in the middle. And that gives me lots of face maps. Other way around here, I can throw in identities at several places. That's how I can see a uh, category as a space. So I do this with this category, vector bundles and isomorphisms. Take the nerve, now I have space. So that's actually this functor is sort of a motility space. Yeah? It picks up a scheme and gives us a space. It represents mm -hmm. a motility space. Mm -hmm. Those were functors from schemes to spaces. Yeah. Uh, now, it's a monoidal category, it's a direct sum. That actually a symmetric monoidal category that gives us an E infinity algebra in space or like a commutative monoid in spaces. And that one I can group complete. That was just the same thing here. Group complete means you do the same thing that you do to to create that one of n. You adjoin inverses to all the things. However you do that. So there's, there's a way topology you have a monoid can form the classifying space and then the loop space of that and that's the group. This may create lots of higher homotopy groups, and the homotopy groups of this are the k groups. Short description of k theory. 
Uh, for dental schemes, it's more complicated. Okay, now there's a theorem. So this, this, this is one of the functions that we want to factorize through our hexagon. It's a very important invariant of schemes. And um, there is a K-theorem stacking that you can, can, you can build up by this using Resmanians, because Resmanians classify GLK as we, as we are supposed to see this exercise. <coughs> Somehow you can build up a rotating spectrum directly out of Resmanians if you do it like that. But, there's a, but I have no Resmanians in my general setting. I cannot say what GLK is, not build a classifying space out of that. So my general setting has to resolve to something else. So there is a theorem which is due to Snaith and topology and to Gefner Snaith and simultaneously or uh, independently uh, Naumann to the state of Oestler. Which says that this K theory spectrum that represents K theory, either logical or algebraic, is what inverts of P infinity. And I'll tell you what that is, and that's my, my excuse for constructing this now. Just wanted to give it a motivation before. So this is something that I can construct in my setting, and all I need is GM. Well, from GM about P infinity, I uh, will have this fourth element and like that. Sort of. So every, everything is implicitly stabilized? Yes, this this is uh, uh, an equivalent spectra. We already are here now. Right. Okay. And that's where it goes. Okay, what do I do? I call this thing the snake spectrum. So I'm defining a spectrum, uh, not yet, I first notice that I have a map. Well, here comes the little difference between point and unpoint. Yeah, we, we've been in the unstable world, we have P-infinity here. We, going from there to there, first add an independent base point and then to a spectrum. We also can put P infinity here and give it a, give it a base point by itself, not a disjoint base point. Uh, I can point it, for example, you know, uh, I can point it through P1. Now P1 was a quotient of A2 without zero, A2 without zero was arising as a As a quotient uh, like this, as a push out. And G is a group, so I have a neutral element here. Uh, I just need a point somewhere. Yeah, I have one. So I take a quotient, I still have a point, and P infinity is according to all of these things. I take my point in P1, okay? That's where I point, it wouldn't matter, I can include any other point. Right? That's where I point P infinity. So I can also see it as a pointed space here. And also P1, what I just actually did. So now I have a map P1, smash P infinity plus, that's the one quarter from here. I can include this P1 into One with another base point here, or not? It's just a destroyed unit, it's an inclusion of the unit. Then I can include my P1 into P infinity here, with this here. Then I should maybe notice that this is the same as P infinity cross P infinity. In parentheses plus. It basically says that this plus functor is monoidal and transforms product here into smash product there. 
That's maybe an exercise. to write always the sigma infinity, so if you allow me to leave it away for spaces, I would be very grateful. If you get confused, I would have stopped me. Um, so we have this map, and in the P1 standardized category, P1, so I can smash this whole map. Now it's a functor, so I can also apply it to maps. I can smash this whole map with the negative of P1. I can smash this copy here away, and it's gone. No? That's how I, because I wrote the functor. And then will, I will denote the, the, whatever happens to this thing here by P1 smash minus 1. Now just to, you can always just recall the number of P1 copies in an object after. After applying this functor here, I get P infinity plus. I don't write the whole thing again, I just write where the target goes. Now I have a, a negative smash power. That's how you write it. Smash P infinity plus. This is called. I'm aware that these are just formal constructions so far, but I mean, it's already good if you are able to recognize that these are global constructions after the setting up or set of the, just just tensoring with the P1 minus 1, yeah. so that's just for multiplication. No, yeah, yeah, taking this map and yes, applying out the inverse of the P1 the inverse inverse. to this map, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then this copy will vanish and there will be a, like a formal copy of, of the inverse of P1. Just. Mm. Ah, but this R, but it uses this multiplication of the. Yes, that's, that's, that's the map that I didn't repeat right here. That's right. due to all of this. Right, I see. Okay, now um, we define this maze, the spectrum. Multiplication map is something, yeah, this plot multiplication. I mean, this one sort of is. Why? I mean, here I have a multiplication map that corresponds to tensoring of line models, right? And I sort of take, take the tautological line bundle here over P1 and multiply it with something, so it's an arbitrary line bundle. That's sort of, yeah, I have sort of an endomorphism of P infinity. Yeah, so it throws some line bundle to itself, uh, to, to some other line bundle, namely the line bundle that I get by tensoring it with the tautological line bundle. This could we could think about it, except that it has a degree shift there. And... So I want to make this an invertible operation, and 
actually know the recipe for this. We just take this linear co limit that we have taken before. Uh, yeah, P to P. We multiply with bottom again and again, and our P1 shifts get deeper and deeper in the process. Exactly what, how we localized a module and then how we stabilized the categories again this cooling and then we multiply multiple. So this has a universal property, it's the universal uh, ring spectrum receiving a map from P infinity, where the <coughs> multiplication becomes a lot. And yeah, why, why do we do this? Because of the theorem. That's a substitute K theory spectrum. I asked um, now much with like Westphal and Gepner, <laughs> but I never met name. <laughs> what would be an appropriate intuition about this result? Yeah. And they <laughs> mostly said, well, somehow it comes out of the computations. It's not, not really very intuitive. But David Gepner offered a bit more and said, well, we have this P infinity, uh, maps into P infinity class by line bundles. And that's something that happens here in an unstable world. Now we go to spectra, that's where things become additive. Yeah? The multiple category is triangulated, we can add maps now. And so there are sort of maps into, into this important spectrum, the consists of P infinity, are now sums of line bundles. Ah, that's closer to vector bundles. So we have like outer dimensions, and you know that every vector bundle splits after the line bundle after the appropriate pullback. And now the rest to get arbitrary vector bundles, even before the splitting, that's somehow achieved by the spot twisting, but you have no intuition about this tool. But it's better than none. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. A proof, I can, I can like, uh, in an accessible story, a proof by lumpy back like this. It's nice. Uh, there's other proofs too, but yeah, as I said, they don't offer a intuition. Okay, now we've got. So, uh, so because if you would try, suppose you take the classified space for vector bundles, um, you could also you also have a multiplication tensor bundle tensor, is it a tensor? I think, uh, right? Uh, uh, yes. So, could I try to do this um, also with this and produce some kind of plot-like element? Absolutely, and that's how the how the comparison map goes. You can find a comparison map by the property of this thing. Because line bundles are vector bundles. You have a map from P infinity to K. Yeah. You have the bot multiplication, and uh, you can check somehow by other means that in K theory this bot multiplication comes from multiple, and that gives you the map. Hmm. Now while it's an equivalence, it's computation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And but there's no but you don't also don't know the intrinsic reason why the, the bot element should become invertible for Okay, we got ourselves an honest spectrum, not just imported from, from somewhere. We constructed this, we really needed to have inverted P1, otherwise, we couldn't have done this. And now, uh, every spectrum represents a cohomology theory. Let's, let's uh, review how, I mean, by representing these things. So, actually, I guess another. So this this uh, p infinity plus as we that we import from space into our spectra is a ring spectrum, meaning it's a uh, has a 
monoid structure, just that, that is important. Yeah? I mean, this sigma infinity plus, I didn't uh, actually say that, I forgot it. <laughs> we, I said we stabilize by smashing with P1, but we stabilize in the world of monoidal categories. We do it just in such a way that the sigma infinity becomes a monoidal functor, symmetric monoidal, symmetric monoidal. And the outcome becomes a symmetric monoidal category. And so our, our multiplication map carries over to the spectrum, right? Uh, maybe I use it already. Instead, maybe more explicitly, maybe. And um, so the fact is that then this, this uh, localization of one element still is a monoid. It's a ring spectrum. In stable categories, yes, this is automatic. If you localize you know, some element, then the outcome is a ring again. It's, it's like for modules. If you, if, you're, if you have an R algebra, so it's a module which happens to have a multiplication, then you localize the module. Then it also has, has still an algebra structure where you localized. These two you know, the properties in the module world and the algebra world coincide. Okay, so we actually got a ring spectrum here. And Spectrum, which are the two classical cases that we have, are K theory, what you're going to write K theory. Okay, so maybe I should. Now for commodity theory, so we start star of some some object that we put in here, object of C. Defined as maps in the homotopy category of spectrum now. From X plus cos K from C to, and I should maybe not write star star dot A B S A comma B smash that. Taking for the metallic spheres that is as one um, so uh, the thing that you count is how many G's are in there. So, so we have these two spheres that we inverted. Count how many G's you have, it's a B, and confusingly you don't count the A doesn't count the S1s, but the total number of spheres. So what we have to write here is B minus A. Is this right? No, A minus B. <laughs> yeah. Is there a good reason for this? I mean this <laughs> Both become spheres topology, right? If you, if you just flatline topology, this is the actual degree shift that you get. Mm -hmm. It actually also is in, in, in these typical model theories. And these are the twists, and those you want to count the extra. So, is, is the G, is this twist related to like the twists that you see in optific 
things like you know tape twists or something. Absolutely, these are tape twists. Yes. Ah. Okay. Ah. Okay. <laughs> okay. But okay, but okay. Well, what do you mean? They are the tape twists. What does that mean? That I mean that's that's the thing that you can do on Galore presentations. So where where do you how about the tape twist? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But I said before that. Especially with GM, it uses a, a twist ah. of the color presentation given by the Taco Mall. Ah. But the T twist is you take like um, some limit of the mu n, right? Which is not G. <laughs> so, no. how does it, so something happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a and B are the integer. Yes. <laughs> <It's not natural>. <laughs> <laughs> but can they can be negative? Next step it would be a complex numbers. Okay, so yeah, so that's that's the thing. We we have a, a topology. We have one index in our in our homology theories because we can shift up these degrees and down, and that's the sort of the number of spheres that we smash in here. And in Motilic homology, now we have two spheres, and they are different, and we can count both of them. And this gives you the index. Actually, it's more reasonable to, I mean, we could, could do the same with any other smash invertible object in our category of spectra. This came up before in the break. And added uh, into an index for every such smash invertible object. And in topology, you can, you can show that these are exactly only the spheres. So S1 is the only, it's, it's enough to count how many S1s are there. S1, so it's one index. Uh, but in multiple multiple theory, there's there's many more vertical objects. There are broad the very varieties are smash and vertical and more stuff. So we could actually have a huge set of indices here, but one that's mostly interested in those. Uh, so so it, it, is it true that somehow this gives you lots more tools to compute uh, and you'll get more filtrations and exactly. you can, uh, can filter uh, some spectrum by the number of, of S1 copies or GM copies or P1 copies that are in there, and you have like, more directors to filter your spectra. This gives you spectral sequences. This is exactly what made it possible to compute new, uh, new stable stamps in topology. This extra filtrations that you get by these. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. Thing. And so it seems actually plausible to, to look for other than elements of the Picard group. So um, yeah, you first got to know then what the car group is, and this is I don't think we need to trouble in any case. To know that the car group is this group of invertible objects, it depends on the smash invertible objects, and you know that pick of uh, one spectra over base scheme S contains a copy of that for the spheres, the topological ones. A copy of T0 of S, the K theory, or K theory of the base scheme. This here contains another Z, and that's the other divide rate. But there could be much more stuff going on. Okay. So now I claim. Okay, we just construct some object and we don't know what it does, what the homology does, but actually we can compute it on, on at least one space. And for the following reason, it is complex oriented. That means the following. Don't, don't talk about any other kind of orientation. That's the following complex oriented. Complex oriented cohomology theories are cohomology theories in which you have a pattern of term classes. In case you know what that is, in case you don't, then watch and learn. <laughs> so, um, these are cohomology theories E star star. Or in, in case of topology, you just need to weigh the second star because the first one counts the total number of spheres, and that's you know, all you need to know topology. Um, and you want 
an X and a multi class B2, comma 1 of T infinity. The bizarre, maybe? Uh, let me maybe repeat this here again. It's the spaces. What is that again? It's F to P infinity plus 2 my, uh, my spectrum, but I have to flash with the 2 1 sphere. What's the 2 1 sphere? It's P1. Mm. Yeah. One has one copy, one GM copy makes two spheres, and one of those is GM. Mm -hmm. I told you just for something of the second cohort here, there would be an S2 here. Uh, okay. Uh, now I can, of course, restrict this down to 2P1, as I can do of P1 to this. First with a plus, and then without. I can again include P1 to this historic unit of base point. And I'm here, and then I have an isomorphism because smashing if you want is an auto equivalence, so at home that's it induces an isomorphism. Yeah. And I get something from the sphere spectrum, so the unit object in our in our uh, wide category is called this dollar sign, it's a typic sphere spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so the metific sphere spectrum is, is, is it the sphere usual? In the topology case? Mm -hmm. No, the, what is the metific sphere spectrum? It's yeah, the whatever, the unit <laughs> element in that thing. Yeah, but it's not it's not S0, S1, S2. No. It's uh, it's the uh, uh, S0 and then imported along this this whole hexagon. But is there a different description? I mean more I, I mean, I will tell you on Friday about homotopy groups. It's completely stable homotopy groups. But, yeah. but is it somehow mix of GM and S1, SN? Or? I, I, with the not sentence, I don't know how to mix them. It's, it's just S0 reported along the way. Okay. So I can map my. I want one class in here. Which, when I map it down this way, becomes the unit. Okay, I have that set it. Uh, here, a ring step. So I want a, a multiplication map. And the multiplication map and a unit. So it's really a moral unit, a moral category. So from S, to E, which is the identity. Just a short uh, naive question. Um, so you said the sphere spectrum is what you get when you map the S0 along the hexagon. Um, this, okay, uh, it's clear that it's true, but it's also kind of surprising, right? Because like this zero, the S0 is just two points. Yeah. Very basic, not interesting space, okay. Um, okay, and wh what happens when we map the one point space along the hexagon? Uh. Well, no, it is one point. Okay, it depends yeah. where you start the hexagon. Yeah. That's true. Uh, uh -huh. I okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I start with the one point space. Yeah. Then I add a base point to gain the pointed space. Yes, okay. That, and that is my unit for the mesh product of pointed spaces. Yes, okay. Yeah. So the, the, the one point space is the unit for the cross product. Mm -hmm. The two point space is the unit for the smash product. And then I have my monoidal functor to spectra. And so yeah. is the max up to the unit then. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's okay. comes from schemes from the one point space. So it's really okay. the field okay. that gives me my field spectrum. And okay. uh, yeah, this computation that I've been talking about before, like the, this continuous stable onto groups of the sphere spectrum there, they uh, contain the mirror K theory of this field. And, uh, so the complex oriented, these complex oriented homology theories uh, also have them in. Uh, Usual topology? Uh, yes. Where is Same definition. Well, you can wait a second to index. And this is CP infinity. Yeah. Right, okay. 
but 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 now you have some extra twist. The, the one gives you some weird. I have the extra thing, but Because this one, it was P1 pointed, this one was the restriction of decision. Restriction. It's restriction. So I have, I have an inclusion of P1, yeah, first to be P1 with an extra plus, and then from there to P infinity with an extra plus. Uh -huh. And then I restrict back. I went to the pre-composition of a map from here to here, uh -huh. with that inclusion map. But then it's not pointed from P1 to P1 plus. Well, I, I should have maybe done the intermediate step. This okay. It is true that this will not be a ring map. Yeah, so, uh, okay, I have a ring spectrum that means when evaluation on space is coming really from C here, uh, the, the outcome will be a ring, a bi-graded ring, multiplication maps. But you can also evaluate it on, on other spectra or other pointed spaces, or just letting out of those, and the outcome will not be a ring. And this here, yeah, I have my restriction maps here. As long as I'm inside spaces here, imported by the plus and then the sigma infinity, these are all ring homomorphisms, but here this one will not be one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, indeed, I mean, this is a degree shift, this can be greater than one. This maybe it's say this is E zero zero point. Of course, our boss, uh, our snake's spectrum is small. And that's with the uh, orientation. I need to produce a class now. And so I can give it by giving a representative of this morphism that I need. And that will just be P infinity plus. goes down to the limit here. Okay, now here's a theorem, but uh, it's time for a break, but I still state it now, then we can look. Want to prove it maybe? Okay, so if I have an oriented Commodity theory, orientation class X or term class X, that's how you call this thing. Plays really the role of term class of line bundle. Um, then you can calculate the value of projective spaces, and it's of the whole commodity ring. And that is the start of the point, whatever that may be, and this, this can be a strange thing. In case you have the base field or something that you don't know, but in terms of that, 
It's the truncation. Okay. That's pretty general result. Okay, let's take a break. What is the degree of Two components. Okay, the same. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Current commodity is some such one such that exists. Oh, like I said, with maybe it's part of the data if you want. Yes. So okay. And so that's the class that gives me the isomorphism in this. Now I have a class sitting sitting in here. I can restrict it down to Pn. So I have like a, a copy of that x in Pn by restricting down from T infinity. And that's what will uh, give me this isomorphism. So I send this x to that x. This is nice. You're more of this size. So some kind of uh, you know, code extension. Just jump. Could say that. But I. We are not. Is there anything you can say about that? No. <laughs> no I'm not really. Uh, what I mean, I don't know what for to, to look at this in a geometric way now. To do algebraic geometry ah. with the homology ring that we get out of. Yeah. Hmm. I guess it's just the same. Do as such as things, in fact, and like a chromatic computer, but that's not what I'm I guess it's just the same as in you know, usual topology. I mean, you get the same result in yeah. usual topology. Yes. Yeah. It's a standard result. I mean, you get it in shower groups, you get it in yeah. many chromology theories, yeah. and they are all oriented because they all have this term last time. It's true for K theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the structure of star star equals. Well, from this star star for point. Yeah. I get it on any space, the ring structure. So, I was saying I want a ring spectrum here. Uh, spectrum. Yes, that's part of the definition of a red commodity. Okay. Yeah. Oh. But anyway, I'm going to wrap this down. It's, uh, so in my head, P A B X and B C B X. What's that? It's uh, maps from M plus to S A B C B plus X plus. Then I can apply the smash functor to the normal functor. So I can uh, smash maps like this and this one and get x plus smash x plus to, and then I have a bunch of spheres here and copies of E. Now this one here, remember, is x cross s plus. And I can pre-compose with the diagonal of x. We just reduce it back to one copy of x. And here, well, uh, I can just put all of these spheres together, the smash spheres adds up the numbers. And here I can, here's my multiplication of the sphere spectrum, uh, of the ring spectrum that finds my point here, that's, that's new. And now I'm back where I want it to be, it's, it's an E, A plus C, B plus B. X, and that's what the greatest ring structure is. So you see also why this only works in cohomology. This is contrary because somehow we 
it's imagine where you get two copies of this X. We have to get back down to one copy, and for this we have to use the diagonal, and that goes the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Homology only have co algebra structures because yes. because of really this little annoying fact that you need that diagonal. Is it uh, is it the exponent n or n plus one in the denominator? It's an, yeah. I wrote an n. Yeah. Am I wrong about this? Uh, does just, just mean like regular singular cohomology of the regular complex project space that would that has as a cohomology ring zx mod x to the n plus one. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. 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 I mean, P zero, the one point space, and then there should be divide of the x. Yeah. I'm excited to see the proof after the break. Me too. I have to go. the break. No, I know. So much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I uh, said we would look at the proof. I uh, <laughs> have to maybe weasel out of this a bit. <laughs> I, 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 I was never intending to give a full proof, but even like the. I don't know, I didn't find a good uh, overview, which wasn't completely sketchy. <laughs> Straight out of this. But here's, I mean, the. At least like the bound of the proof. <laughs> <laughs> the asking apologists, they always just say, I don't know, Atia hurts a book or something, and then. But it's it's a very elementary thing. You do it by induction, actually. And I lost my page. And you just uh, set up the following thing. Let's first look at this uh, as a module, maybe, you know. So, this here has um, this thing I can write as a direct sum. Uh, just not to get confused with indices, I'll do it by copying. Then I have E star minus 2i and star minus i. So I go down this three simultaneously point. So my my induction hypothesis is that this is a model of EPN minus one, actually a ring ring uh, isomorphism. Mm -hmm. Now these things sit in on exact sequences. There's an obvious one upstairs here. So in the, in the next place I write just uh, what I what you see here. So this thing going one level higher, yeah, the other the truncated polynomial ring which goes one further. And I do have an app here to star star and I'm just sketching this now. It uh, will not be maybe totally satisfying. Yeah, this here should be induced by the inclusion of minus one to the So this is a ring homomorphism, really. This is a ring isomorphism. This is really here. I'm, I'm just multiplying things in the, in the graded cohomology ring of a point, sort of, and put them in different degrees, so it's, it's our graded rings set up by hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I said before that this, this statement is, is written down very shortly, but uh, there's a specific sense to it. I have this orientation <coughs> class x, it restricts to some class here, and this, this x here should be sent to that restricted x there. I call everything x, not so too, too confusing. But that's what this isomorphism should be. And so these different levels here should correspond to the powers of the x. And so this is what, what maybe it was not a good choice to write it down this way, I don't know. It's okay. I could, I could write 
quite formal text to the file. And that would be it. Right? Okay, and so, so yeah, this map, I do have a map here, it sends. Um, Let's start with it being a module map that sets just x to i to this x to the i, which exists when being imported from here. Uh, I have this ring homomorphism here. Um, and that's the thing one has to see whether this is a commutative square. Uh, okay, I know, I know that x to the n, which exists here, but not here, gets just projected away. Yeah. That's because I want something less. It goes to zero here, so whatever, wherever it goes here, it, it reaches zero here. Yeah? It comes to the kernel here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, the kernel upstairs is of course clear, it's just the missing summit. It's e to the star minus to the n star minus n point. So what I mean here times x to the n. And so downstairs here I have this inclusion and I can compute the cofiber in spaces. That's again an unstable computation which I just uh, have to let you believe. This is not something I can do. So I mean here's the cofiber, it's Pn what would Pn minus 1 and it so that, that would be the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's far, uh, I think it's reasonable. So is this still in your in your general abstract yes. setup? Okay, yes, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. And that's but that's where it actually it's somewhat complicated. The topology is it still has a rather easily geometrically seen maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to say next, so this here is um, So my claim is that this is the n-fold product of P1 smash n. Mm. Yeah, I mean you can, you can think of this here of course as being an a n plus an infinite p n minus one, and if you contract that one, maybe you get an n sphere, and that's what is here. But yeah, I have to think of the man always <coughs> double because we think of complex points. Mm -hmm. So topologically, this is a completely reasonable thing. Yeah, you contract an, an end sphere and you have a, a huge ball. Now, uh, motivically, I also in the world of algebraic geometry, really, this is a lemma of Morel, well, along with other lemmas. I mean, this is still not so hard. You can do this with a few relations. So this, what do you see it to And it's still this, in this general. Actually, that's not, also not the hard part. Uh, so here we got E star star P1 smash N. But this is now I, I do I do this this Push out here in pointed spaces, that's the thing. But here, here I put in my, my extra base points if I want, but I'm taking the cofiber that doesn't matter, I mean, they, they get projected away anyway. And here I have a pointed space, that's my outcome. And somehow here, yeah, this, this uh, shifted to here. Well, there's, there's a somewhat tricky part to see that this part here will move actually, but I got a, a computative diagram of long sequences. This here is just the, the shift isomorphism. Yeah? I have this uh, n-fold shift in indices here, and that's exactly my n-fold shift by 2,1 spheres that I have downstairs here. So that's an isomorphism. That's an isomorphism. As long as that sequence comes from this co-fibration downstairs, and uh, that's that goes in both directions. And of course, I want to use the five lemma. Uh, 
And that's the upshot that I think I'm going to stop here. But <laughs> sorry, I promised more maybe. But I mean, you see, it's a hands on thing, but there is some slightly subtle geometric input there about, about this behavior of this left hand square and what, what it does to the multiplication in the next one. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is a completely geometric argument, and, and even still in the algebraic geometry world, and I had to replace it in my work to by some Khan extension arguments and one that still goes through. Slightly, slightly less true, but still true enough for that. Um, got a vague question. Yeah. Namely, in classical algebraic geometry, mm -hmm. uh, we also have the real projective spaces, uh, classical algebraic topology. Yes. And their cohomology rings slightly bit different than that. Yes. So where in this setup do the complex numbers enter? Or why, if they do not enter, why why do we still obtain the same result as if we are if we would be dealing with the complex projective spaces instead of the real projective spaces? I mean, uh, it's, it's partly the definition of orientic cohomology theory. We we demand this x to sit in the place of the two sphere, so that's okay. p one. Uh -huh. That's where we go. Okay. And yeah, I can't think of any other place. Okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, finding real analogs of of the or of the, the, the analogs of what we get when you take the real points and you them this in the algebraic categories is always yes. a bit tricky. Often you have some Galois actions to carry around or yes. something. Okay. okay, yeah, so that's what uh, I would like to say, not more. It's rather I do some other questions. <laughs> okay, but it's, I mean, it's a calculation that goes through the generality, and this thing is another calculation that I can do later for you. Uh, so our uh, snake spectrum is an oriented ring spectrum, so we know we can compute it well, up to whatever it is back on the point uh, on projective spaces. And so, these maps here, well, they are the, they are the four the truncations maps, right? So from EPN to EPN minus one, I really divide out one more x power. That's really the ring homomorphism that, that I get here. And this we can use to uh, also calculate an oriented cohomology theory on P infinity. And that's the power series ring, it's the inverse limit then. There's an electron effect sequence. The certain limb one term. And then you have the co limit. The space xi, which is a co limit. And then you map the limit. There's a comparison map. Uh, and you have to check whether this limb one term vanishes, then you have nice movement. Does vanish yeah. if the transition maps in your, in your system are subjective, which they are because there are these projections here. Hmm. That's the, okay. That's the little fact that you lose about this, what exactly you found out about the body maps. Okay. Now, Although I don't know any other in this generality. 
So we can apply our homology now to the multiplication that appear filled. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we start star point power series. And um, okay, another fact we have sort of a good formula in this case. So that's a good enough case, but it's not just a demo. Same thing about field coefficients. But here, what we get for this value is power series thing in two variables. And this whole map is determined by where the x goes. This continues for this limit topology because now these maps are determined by what they do in the final stages. So we get some power series into variables here. And this power series is a formal group law. Ah, I see people nodding next to them. So, so what is that? Um, That means, well, it's a power series which starts with no constant terms, then an x and a y, and then higher terms. And we have f of f, x, y, that equals f of x and f, y, that. So it's also not the associativity thing, and what you should think about is that this is what the depth space of, of a legal with a neutral element looks like. So, I mean, the P infinity is a group object, and that's why we get a form of group law here, when you apply this contravariant functor. And For example, we have the additive group. Yeah, you would you would add stuff. That's that's the operation the additive group, and you always go to the neutral element and go from there, like a little like, tiny amount away. Then you add and go from there a tiny amount away, and then you see. What it gives you, I mean, that's, that's just for the group of the, of the, of the additive group law, they have no higher terms at all. And for GM, you would get, now you take the neutral element, which is 1 in this case, you get an epsilon away from it, which is x, multiply with another thing, which is epsilon away. This is 1 plus x plus y plus x times y. And then, yeah, you sort of disregard, I mean, now that you are in the jet space, you don't have to uh, recall this element where you started, so we sort of, sort of say, yeah, you have to this constant term. Here it was zero anyway, for the corresponding form of group law is x plus y plus x times y, so it's finite power series, I mean, You can do this for any algebraic group, for example. And so we get such a form of group law out of our oriented commodity theory. And our example of the snake spectrum. Can compute it. And it is x plus y. It's a multiplicative formal group law, which is actually what you also get before. And, so on. and it is, I guess this beta is a factor in this. I've heard people complain that there should be a minus. I don't know where I chose some other convention, but it's really what comes out of my calculation. <laughs> Have you checked your computational actor? No. 
Mm. Then it might be a madness. Yeah, absolutely, and that's actually my thing that I hope to initiate when I go to Pittsburgh. So. Uh -huh. Okay, what does this buy us? It has this formal group law. Well, in general, there's a whole beautiful story about chromatic homotopy theory and oriented component theories, and you can sort of uh, it's a shadow of this world. This. But, okay, so it also makes it possible in the, the long run, after a few more steps, to continue our journey through the hexagon. So we are now in the in the stable world, we produce the uh, spectrum that reproduces K theory, sort of, in the you know, abstract setting, but specializes to algebraic and topological K theory. And actually, to uh, I think, Atiyah's real K theory, and this is the two equivariant setting that I also mentioned as an example. <laughs> so, <coughs> for doing the next step, so for uh, finding an Einberg Glane spectrum and then taking the modules over that and then having an analogon to the category of motives, well, I need to find an Einberg Glane spectrum. That's Something that you can do maybe in, in different ways. So the way I do is uh, I'll find a rational Einberg Glane spectrum, not a, not a one with the integer coefficients. And so there's a classical theorem that the K theory spectrum uh, I guess maybe due to atoms, I'm not actually sure. So if you take the K theory spectrum and and the root with Q, sort of pass, pass to the corresponding uh, commodity with Q coefficients. And this spectrum composes as a sum, you can draw this by wedge also in the category of spectrum. It's the direct summary of product of copies of the same spectrum but uh, shifted. Or in our motivic world, shifted well, by P1 smash powers. So. HB some spectrum, or the valence spectrum, and that thing represents motivic commodity with rational coefficients in the motivic world, uh, and rational singular cohomology in the topological world. So that's, that's one way to obtain it by rationalizing our K-theory spectrum and then taking out this comment. <coughs> but then we have, of course, to prove that this thing splits and that we have such summits. So here's two approaches to this. Here's one. <coughs> so what do I need? I need, I need endomorphisms. Which make which decompose my K theory spectrum into summons, uh, eigenpotents, which, which make it split. So, I will need to make it rational later on to actually get there, but here's the, the ansatz, as you can also all uh, say in English. I want to know an endomorphism of this. Okay. What I have in front is a co limit. I can pull it out. And this was a co limit of a lot of bot multiplications. Which shifted down here by one copies and so on. Shifts, but I mean, <coughs> just 
quite what, what uh, will appear here. That's what's the limit of the following? Okay. Let me just denote this by k. Now we don't have any other k theory spectrum, so it saves me a few letters. With k of a point, and we computed what this is on the p infinity plus the power series string. Yeah, because my bot multiplication map has a degree shift, it's not, not really a ring homomorphism. The lower some degree the, the degree of max by something possibly. Um yes, all that goes. I'm also doing this because like I what I was talk to people in exercise sessions and they couldn't really believe that with these expert definitions of, of spectra and so on and maps and spectra as so cohomology classes it could calculate anything but here I actually did it <laughs> and I'm really bad at calculating worse than any of you probably um, so what I do I let me write down this bot multiplication map again what it was. Yeah, I have this infinity plus, my infinity plus. That was my actual multiplication. Then I have the p1 plus my infinity. That was the thing that I had before shifting the p1 to the other side. But I used to define what multiplication. This. Now let's apply a theory to this. We start down, we'll bring the value faster. Because these are the transition maps in our limit thing. Yeah? Then we get some algebraic expression here for, the, for these, the limit of these, of these groups that we can compute. And that's the endomorphisms of our spectrum. And that's where we have to find projectors <coughs> and both elements. Okay, so here this one. We know this. Let's take the point out of this thing. This one I told you, it's our series ring in two variables. And x goes to this formal group law. That's how it was defined. x plus y plus beta x y. Now we restrict it along the inclusion map of p1 and p infinity. We also know what that does. It truncates power series ring uh, seriously in the case of p1 down to x squared. That's power series x, y, but modulo, let's say, y squared. And well, that doesn't change anything because there's no y squared. Okay. I could write it also as a, as a direct sum now. It's power series ring plus 
this compute times y of all series. So y squared is divided out, there is just y or no y. And so if I, if I show if I look at what happens here, I get it gets thrown to x on this side and y times one plus beta x on the other side. Just a different expression of the same thing. Now, this restriction here, and as I said before, it's no longer a ring map. Here, here I was in, inside spaces. These are maps coming from, from spaces, or like my original category C. And this is a pointed thing, and these don't induce ring maps anymore. So now I, I throw away the copy corresponding to this point in P1. That's the Kx copy. I just stay with the other one. So I adjust and up with this here in summary. And it means I throw away this and I've got 1 plus beta x times 1. And now, well, the way I wrote it here, I just had copies of the same power series thing everywhere. Well, because I can just identify this with the star star point of the string x, and the y doesn't really have any function anymore. Right? And now it's just one plus beta x. <coughs> so these are my. These are my maps. They, they send x to 1 plus beta x. Okay. So we think, given what we got so far, this, this really now becomes completely algebraic and doable. Uh, well, this was just x. We don't know what it does in other elements yet. We have to do it for power series in general. Let's try x to the n, and that's, that's actually all we need then. x to the n. Well, it's the end fold product of x, and here we are in the world of ring maps still. So here we get uh, x plus y. Well, let's go here right away. Okay. Here, because nothing. Oh, no. oh. Uh, so we go to x plus y plus beta x y to the n. What is that? It's. Okay, multiply this usual it's this binomial coefficient times y to the i times 1 plus beta x to the n minus i times x to the n minus i. I think I'm right about this. Now, this time uh, something changes. As we, as we delete everything with x squared and upwards. The 1 plus beta x is up to i. Sorry? The 1 plus beta x is up to i. It's the same coefficient with the y. So it's y i, 1 plus beta x i. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I put this y out of the parentheses. Here. It's an i. Okay, whenever a, a, a y squared or upwards appears here, this, this summit gets deleted in the next step. And what we end up with is x to the n plus ny 1 plus beta x and x to the n minus 1. The two highest powers of the x to the n. The lower powers that have higher, higher y's, then we get thrown away. What did I do in the next step? I deleted just the x part and kept the, kept the y part. And then I forgot about the y because this adds more here. So this goes next to n times 1 plus beta x, x to the n minus 1.
Okay. Now, uh, if I call this F, this power series, this is a very particular one, of course. This is 1 plus x times the derivative of x of x by x. Well, that's how I have derived three things. And power series, again, I, I use this density thing, I have a limit topology, and these things are continuous with a limit topology. I can uh, write down every power series as a limit of x to the n, plus some coefficients, but these are module maps, and coefficients don't really uh, change anything, so this is the general rule. But the whole thing is not a ring map. No. Uh -huh. So general f also goes here. So it's a very curious map. And this, so that's our transition maps here. Here's a derivative, if you, if you phrase it that way, you don't have to, of course. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's, it's a bit funny, the state of affairs here. So, of course, all of this is over the k theory of a point, which we don't know what it is. But let me make this remark, because it's like this kind of things. So uh, in the case of topological space, I mean, all of this is valid in topological K-theory, and then the K-theory of a point is Z. Yeah. And then, that's uh, the point, we only have trivial vector bundles, and there's one of every dimension that's Z yeah. after group of feet. And so we have this kind of thing, and we, we, we look for power series of coefficients in Z, uh, for a sequence of power series of coefficients in Z, which satisfies this kind of, of compatibility condition. So it's, sort of, it's a sequence of solutions to some differential equation, if you want. And one can show, which I learned from Ruel Liu in this thesis, that set of solutions in this case, uh, it's for good enough coefficient rings anyway, uh, only depends on the first element, so there's, uh, there's at most one lift to this whole tower. The question is only the existence. Uh, it's classical uh, by Adams and Clark, some 70s article, I think. That set of solution is uncountable. uncountable. But Examples. <laughs> 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 uh, linear combinations <laughs> the of that <laughs> of uh, one plus x and one over one plus x seems a power series by geometric series trick. <laughs> you can check that these two are solutions that you want. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Formula. That's all. But we know there must be uncountably many by some k theoretic topologic, topological considerations. Somehow, how many morphisms this bridge we must have? Uh -huh. Does the argument start with saying assume it's countable? Or assume what? Assume, assume for the sake of contradiction that it's countable, or I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I did look up the article back then. Yeah. So, but this whole thing is. Uh, not, but this is almost strictly metaphysic, or it's no. I mean, it's just, all of this is strictly general. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah, so in this your super general setup, so it's also true for topological. Absolutely, this this is a special case of K theory uh -huh. with integer coefficients. K theory of a point in topology is Z, uh -huh. and then we are in this awkward situation of this super well studied. Uh, okay. Homology theory, and we don't know. I mean, no, it has countable uh, monoids and the morphisms there, but we only know these. But we can say, no, 
secure through provisions. So so I passed to this commodity theory where I, where I categorize everything with Q and also show you in some exercise set how to do this more formally maybe. Uh, there are more known. Uh, yeah. You can write down explicit projectors and summons them and a decomposition of this thing in the in com copies of some spectrum. Let's call it H2 now. Uh, and we have shifts its mass powers here. And this H2 where well, we can just get out of the, the zero summit and then define this to be the <coughs> so I just tell you this now as an end result of something. So we have these projectors, it's not clear whether they cover all of the cases somehow. There's a whole second kind of argument that you have to go through to, to say that this goes through in this generality. And actually, by knowing facts about the break K theory, say that this must be everything. Uh, as in movement topology and as in motility commodity, there's Adams operations on these, this K theory, which is given by taking bundles and taking exterior powers of those. And these summons are the Adams eigenspaces. And this is also true in this generality. Uh, And here somewhere. So let me. Oh, so is this this thing that you said that rationally everything is a shift of. Uh, it's it's not surprising that rationally everything becomes sort of versions of Einberg Planck spec spectrum. Yeah. That, oh yeah, that's that's uh, the thing in the consequence of Lampe by exactness, which which in the topology holds and the motivic the theory holds, but with the general setting, no. there's no algebraic cobaltism spectrum, that's what you need to start talking about. Not with exactly. So here there's no... But it happens to be true. Well, I mean, here it's, uh, I define this thing to be the thing that comes up by splitting, so... But ah. all the summons are the same, this happens to be true, yes. Uh, but you, wait, you defined HQ to be the... Zero of the summon. But the, but couldn't you define H in a different way as well? Yes, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Second question. So we take the sphere spectrum, the unit in our model thing, and I have this involution in here. That's an endomorphism of order 2, yeah, that really twice gives the uh, identity, namely, I just smash up twice with P1, that's an equivalence in our stable category, so this is an isomorphism. And here I can switch to smash factors. Uh -huh. If I do it twice, I have identity, obviously. So I have such a map then. And then I get the splitting of my field spectrum. I get an idempotent morphism or two. Namely, and I have to invert two first, or just rationalize, which I do anyway, of S U, well, or if you want to insist on doing too much, S inverted two only. One half identity minus tor. And one half identity plus one. Yeah, if you if you apply this twice, what do you get? 
composition is uh, bilinear, so I get it after it, then I get minus tor and minus tor again. And uh, plus or squared. Yeah. That's that's identity, so I get two times int minus four, but I divide by one half and then it's fine. So can you yeah. explain when how square is the identity? Of course if I switch the two factors twice, then I have switched them back. Also tau? Tau is what switches these two. And that's how we define tau. Yes. Ah. Why? Um. And why do you want idempotent endomorphisms? Or like because idempotent endomorphisms, so my category is complete and co complete. Yeah, I, I always stay presentable, and then in, in particular, all idempotents split and, and split my objects into, into two sums. So, wait, this is always true to be presentable and co complete by the plate. Because that would imply scope of being complete, yes, part of the definition. No, no, but this also means split the analog? Yes, you construct the, the summons as, as co limits or limits. Oh, this okay. limit. Both, both works great. Both ways work, actually. And I think they are even um, absolute co limits, right? Uh, true. Yes. Splittings by of yes, item caps. Preserved by any functor. Okay, so now we can go to we rationalize it. So we do this, and we get a splitting to the positive and the negative rational sphere spectrum. And that one, we can show is isomorphic with HQ. Mm -hmm. There's a second construction that we call the Morel spectrum or something. Morel, if you notice this first. So these are two different constructions a priori, and they turn out to be the same thing again, as, as is true in, in motivic commodity theory, in motivic commodity theory. So you could say, sort of, I, mean, I start out motivated by the story of the field element and deeper basis of schemes. So you could say that, well, well I'll stop now with the thought, because it's up. So you could say that. Uh, you can always ask whether things descend to a deeper base. Yeah? And so, we can, we can have to summarize this talk now that saying that okay, the projective spaces and so on, they, they descend. Uh, this isomorphism of P infinity and, and BG descends, BGM, all the way to the field with an element and much, much deeper to this, to this universal setting that I, that I mentioned. The K field spectrum descends, its base change from there all the way. And uh, so is the rational motivic homology spectrum, and so is the isomorphism between the two versions of it, the, the, the Adams summit and the Morel spectrum in this positive rational sphere. So these are things that are not at all obvious at first, and actually the proof of this here is completely different from what's in the literature. After that, I really used uh, considerations of cycles and so on. I don't have cycles, I don't have schemes. This is, there's another proof by formal nonsense, which is so this is sort of a descent theorem to, to some insanely deep base. Mm -hmm. So this SQ splitting is true also for a sphere, it's true general, right? So what it seems quite surprising to me. Yeah, topology, uh, I think there's almost zero. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> In what did you come to three or not? There, there it gets interesting there, what this is and that is. Well, I mean, this we did commodity, we don't know, <laughs> but uh, this one is sort of linked to the quadratic form part of base. So I'll end with just a quick picture here now, yeah, without putting names to our, our uh, extra gods anymore. Probably memorize them. I also memorized that the arrow. Go the other way. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. You're such a good memorizer. <laughs> Next, tackle the digits of pi. So, the constructions we did, remember what we actually did. Yeah, We um, took these GMs, we glued as certain co limits in, in G objects, we glued the budget affine spaces. We took by quotient, quotients this, uh, we defined the PNs, but the PNs also could be defined as co limits of, of, of points and GMs. Uh, as usual, affine plane covering. Uh, so, these are all colon constructions. And well, actually, this, this corner somehow is, is what I eliminated. So actually, it doesn't really belong to this picture. <laughs> we have we had our general input C here. Yeah, we, we have maybe a, we have your motelic spaces here, and we have spaces here, and we have the inserting complex points functor here, and that for the next next one passes through to everything because everything was defined with those properties always. That's so uh, maybe time for green. So, yeah, maybe the green is not good. Okay. Here came the uh, I end up writing the words. Okay, the pointed version, right? And there's a induced map here by the inverse properties. Then there came the optic spectra stabilizations here, <coughs> induced maps here. And then, okay, now let's say H2 mod and H2. Then we actually have these things and can go wherever we want. But actually, it's this lower path that I made for toilet. Actually, I could do that. So we had it for a general category C now, but this whole thing is from toilet because our constructions were made by cool limits. Uh, for, for the same, for example, the same is true for the <coughs> A theory spectrum, right? It's, it was a cool limit of these P infinity along some bot maps, and. Well, the morphisms they, they, they were constructed in a uniform way. This will pass along these functors. We have them. So we have this universal setup, which maps everywhere. And again, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pointed version, there's a stable version. All of these things map everywhere. That sort of what I said was a descent theorem. It descends. All this stuff descends back up here. And whatever you may call the field of one element, if you're interested in that, it will sit beyond that, in front of that. So that's sort of a uniform descent theorem to have one of all these constructs that I did. Mm -hmm. But also, of course, to, to I don't know, uh, analytic geometry or whatever you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop here. And Thank you. <laughs> so, questions? But this universal is this F1 thing. No, universal is this uh, uh, classifying Cartesian close presentable category for group objects that I had. So spaces to the presented Oh, field. sorry. Okay. Field field field. And that's yeah, I'm going to say. This I want to come back to that because it's actually an easier setting than than specific space or anything. That's insane. There's there's a lot of algebraic geometry going on. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. But that's a very clean setup, and you can try to compute, for example, what's the case of a point in that place. And then you have something present in every K theory everywhere, from the K theory of Z or of F1, which is something. Also, where does the F1 come in? Or do you oh, it's just whatever you call F1, it will sit below that. Because over F1, we do have GM. That's all I mean. Mm -hmm. oh. You mean there's another category to the left of that that will kind of map into this? No, no, this is the leftmost thing, and whatever you call F1 ah, geometry, below. we give rise to a corner like like this top here. So okay. there's schemes, and whatever you call F1 schemes will supposed to sit beyond that. There's a base change functor. Yeah. But GM is, according to everybody, coming from here by base change. And so 
we have a natural missing uh, person. Right, okay. So what's the map of schemes you talk for? Inserting complex points and okay. and dying with the analytic topology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's along this map that they uh, introduce uh, map well, elements of the stable homotopy groups and so on, so spheres. That they find find things, they find maps in motivic spaces, and then carry them along this map. Mm -hmm. okay. Although they also use the reorganization sometimes. Better. So, uh, what about uh, I asked you? Very pretty or pretty calm one of these pairs that. The F1, well, the K theory of uh, F1 is the stable one. Is anything true like that? Yeah, I, that's, that was actually my initial motivation for this. I was, I was hoping to find some F1 setting where this is true for my K theory and then use the same kind of thing, use these double filtrations that I have for, for the yeah. sphere directions and maybe get a uh, spectral sequence and so on. Yeah. But it's not that easy. I mean, what, <laughs> what we need here are sort of P1 periodic uh, cohomology theory. So, so there must be like this P1, they must be represented by a P1 spectrum. And this sort of is a requirement on the, on the behavior of cohomology theory. And, when, what it's not so easily uh, achieved somehow. It's, uh, if you can also do an intermediate step and just uh, stabilize by S1, and that's definitely a place for what you can, where you can uh, find, find spectra to, which, which go to the sphere spectrum in the front geometry, but not the P1 spectra easily. I'm, I'm still, I cannot really rule it out yet, but uh, something left over. So the bird. But it is true. So is very pretty or very kind of pretty? Very, well, very, very pretty, pretty, I would say. So is it true in motivic space? Motivic space? Oh, no. I mean, what does it say? Yeah. Very pretty is a, is a statement about what you get as the K-theory of the finite set, category of finite sets yeah. seen as a Balthausen category. Yeah. So it's, it's an absolute statement. I mean, so how would it, what would be the burden in motivic spaces? Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's me. no variable left to, to <laughs> fill, I think. <laughs> theory. Uh, but I mean, in there you have finite sets. Yes. You can take sure. And a B of that in some sense. I think, yeah, but I uh, think it's an actual copy of finite sets. Yeah. Okay, Further questions? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, then uh, before we uh, uh, conclude the session, I have a couple of uh, remarks. Maybe I want to express my gratitude uh, to a couple of persons who made this possible. Firstly, there were organizers lurking in the background, uh, namely Lydia Angelieri and Peter Schuster. Uh, then there was the PhD student, uh, Judo Pellin who helped me a lot in the local organizing, like getting the rooms and setting up everything. And then I want to express a really not a remark, thanks to Valeria Lanza from the IT department, because she was uh, the person who made it possible to have these uh, lectures recorded, and she really put up a notable amount of her time in order to make sure that everything works smoothly. So uh, when we now give a big round of applause to our hero, Peter, uh, I'd like to have some amount of that across also go to those people. Thank you. And discuss this plans for tomorrow.